Good morning, everyone. I am Sister Claire Bass. And I would like to, on behalf of the Racial and Cultural Justice Committee, I would like to welcome you to our first Joe Talk of 2021. Speaking of Joe, I hope you have a good cup of Joe or tea and breakfast this morning. If you're able to be in person, if we were able to be in person, I'd be seeing everyone enjoying their cup of tea. So raise your mugs to the camera and let's see each other enjoying our coffee and tea. And or tea. Um, so as we focus our anti-racism efforts within our community, we know that all institutions are in infiltrated with racism. And we also know that all the injustice and, and oppression people in our society face today intersects, intersect in their lives to wreak havoc. This year in 2021, the Racial and Cultural Justice Committee has decided to take a deeper look or a deep dive into racism within our financial system and what we can do to change this. Mr. Richard Bonglan starts us off with the issue of raising the minimum wage right today. And then our next topic will be the wealth gap and accumulating intergenerational wealth. And our final topic of the year will touch on racism within capitalism. We encourage you to attend the future Joe Talks and continue to educate yourselves with resources we share. And we also, and also to take action to advocate for change. We're all in this together advocating for justice. Now, Sarah Baker will lead us on quick Zoom instructions. And Sister Kate Regan will now lead us in prayer. Loving God, we confess that we have not fully accepted the challenges of seeking your justice in the world. We define justice in ways that preserve our own self-interest, forgetting that your justice may call us to great sacrifice. We pray for workers whose wages are so low that they face terrible choices between paying the rent and feeding their families. We pray for the courageous cries of the poor, of the workers, for justice, that they will be heard by the employers, by the community, and by our government. We pray for employers in our city that we have accepted their responsibility to pray their workers enough to live. We pray for companies that abuse the dignity of their workers and refuse to seek the employers or employees as brothers and sisters. We pray for all citizens of our community that we will hold our government and businesses in our community accountable for the ways that they treat their workers. God of compassion, hear our prayer. Amen. Thank you, Kate. So today we welcome Mr. Richard Von Glan to speak to us. Thank you for sharing your morning with us, Richard. Who has served, he has served as the policy director of Missouri Jobs with Justice for the past eight years, fighting for an economy that works for all Missourians. He's helped lead the efforts to raise the minimum wage in St. Louis in 2015, statewide in 2018, and then to defend those increase, increases once they were passed. His advocacy efforts began in college. He's a proud alumni of Washington University and lives in South St. Louis with his wife. Again, if you have any Richard questions for Richard, please type your name in the chat box and I will call on you at the appropriate time to ask your question. And without further hesitation, um, th thank you, Richard. Great, um, thank you. And I appreciate everyone for, for having me this morning and um, you know what sounds like hopefully the first of, of many great discussions that you're all going to have in the in the coming weeks and months. I'm going to try to share my screen real quick as we um, um, 
Okay, can folks, can I get a thumbs up if, if this is showing up correctly? Okay, um, so uh, again, my name is Richard Von Glan. I work for Missouri Jobs with Justice. Um, for those of you not familiar with what Missouri Jobs with Justice is, we are a coalition of labor, community, faith, and student groups that um, fight for workers' rights, for an economy, and a, and a democracy that works and values working people, works for and values working people. Um, I, see, I see some familiar names on the participant list, so I'm always glad to know I'm, I'm here with friends. And if you're not familiar with us, I'll share some more information about our organization at, at the end. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, a, a sort of long history and back and forth over the minimum wage that has played out in Missouri over the last um, six or seven years, as well as the historical context that that sits in um, and hopes that that can lead to some fruitful conversation at the, at the end. So I wanna start with just some historical context. The minimum wage in the United States was first established in 1938 as part of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, and during the debate about whether or not there should be a minimum wage in the country or whether or not um, businesses had the inherent right to pay anyone whatever the business deemed appropriate, um, we have this sort of historical quote from then President FDR about no business which depends um, for existence on paying less than living wages to the workers has any right to continue in this, in this country. And I think this has been a fundamental question about the minimum wage for many, many years as to whether or not businesses or whether or not the government has a role in ensuring that workers have access to wages that can sustain them and that they can, they can provide a life for themselves and their families on. I wanna give some context about the minimum wage over time um, and what has happened to it. Um, so this is a look at a chart of the, the minimum wage compared to the rate of inflation. Um, and you can see in the, in the upper chart, this sort of orange line that the peak value of the minimum wage came in 1968, um, a time where frankly the economy was, was growing in this country. Um, and since that time, um, we have seen a 31% decrease in the value of the minimum wage in the economy. So this is how many goods and services you could buy um, for the, the, same, the same dollars. Um, the minimum wage itself has gone up, but it purchases less than it, than it has um, at its peak in, in 1968. And that has been a pretty consistent um, downward trend since that time with occasional spikes. Um, when there was federal action taken. And so that's one look at how the minimum wage compares to inflation. Um, I, I actually like looking at it in, in another way. Um, you will see the actual minimum wage, um, again, as compared to inflation in the red line in this chart and its historic value um, then you'll see a light blue line, which is if the minimum wage had kept pace with the average wage growth um, for workers um, in the country. Um, and then the line that I really like to look at is what would the minimum wage be on that top darker blue line if it had kept pace with productivity? Um, and I like looking at that because I like thinking about what would the wage be if it was tied to the wealth created by the workers doing that work? 
um, not just what should the, the number be as it relates to what a minimum wage worker should be able to, to buy or live on, but what is the actual wealth that that minimum wage, that that worker is creating? Um, and I think that is a good way to understand what we are talking about if we're talking about um, fighting, fighting poverty, frankly, or fighting inequality. Um, and uh, that's just a, a useful context that I think we have and that we, we think about as we go forward. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll go back to this. So, so seeing this, um, I'm going to take a position that it, that it is clear that the, the value of the minimum wage, however you look at it, um, is going in the wrong direction. Um, you know, workers are struggling to get by and people who are, who are working hard for a living can't make ends meet. And so then the question becomes, so how and who should frankly raise the minimum wage? And this has been a debate that we have been having in Missouri um, for a long time. Um, and you see here one of the leading groups that's been pushing this debate, um, the Show Me 15 a campaign that has um, existed for, for nearly a decade now. Um, we can look at um, this photo and to the introductions where we talked about intersections of the minimum wage on uh, racism uh, and frankly sexism in the economy. The reality um, is that a disproportionate number of minimum wage workers are um, black or brown and a disproportionate number are female. Uh, we're probably all familiar with knowing that a, a, the average black worker makes a fraction of, of what the average white worker makes and the same is true um, for female workers. And so this question about who should raise it and what should be done. Well, I'm gonna take us back to 2015 um, where frustrated by the fact that um, the federal government had not raised it in several years and that poverty was an increasing problem in the St. Louis region. Um, let the, the aldermen and activists and the mayor um, decided that St. Louis should raise the minimum wage. It was clear that the state wasn't going to do it, that the federal government wasn't going to do it. And so St. Louis decided to act. Um, and they passed and they passed a law um, to increase the minimum wage. In response to that, the state legislature passed a bill saying that no city, not St. Louis, Kansas City, Springfield, or anyone else, has the authority to pass a law to raise the minimum wage. Um, they actually did something that was broader than the minimum wage and included policies requiring employers to provide paid sick leave, um, fair scheduling, other issues, but um, it was really where the state decided to step in and um, overturn over a hundred years of precedent in Missouri law and say that cities do not have the right to represent and advocate for their constituents in this way. Um, this was not something that has just happened in Missouri. This has happened all across the country. Um, in response to that, um, Jobs with Justice and, and a lot of our member organizations actually sued about that law. And we went up to the Supreme Court um, and we won. We actually won a unanimous court decision that said, nope, that law is, is valid, um, the, the St. Louis law. And so it should go into effect. Well, the day after we did that, the legislature came back and said, okay, we're not just going to restrict cities' rights going forward, we're gonna nullify anything that they've done historically. Um, and so the, the legislature on the behest of business groups that were lobbying them um, came back 
and said, no, um, the city doesn't have the right to do it forward, to do this going forward. And they never had the right to do it to begin with. And anything that they did do that the court deemed was fair um, should be overturned. Um, and so that is what happened. Um, workers in St. Louis saw an increase that had just gone into effect quickly overturned. And so in response to that, um, Jobs with Justice and our allies um, launched a campaign that was called Raise Up Missouri, um, which was a statewide ballot initiative to increase the minimum wage, not just in, in the city of St. Louis, um, but across the entire state. Um, poverty is actually higher in many rural parts of the state than it is in St. Louis. Um, and so we sought to raise the wage across the entire state. Um, doing that, Missouri, again, for over a century has had a petition or has had a process in which citizens can directly petition one another to put issues on the ballot. Um, and so that is what we did. I imagine many of you have probably been approached uh, by a Jobs with Justice volunteer or volunteered yourself um, to, to gather signatures um, on important issues like this. Um, so we had thousands of volunteers go out and gather over 200,000 signatures to place this issue on the statewide ballot to ask Missouri voters, should we increase the minimum wage across the entire state? And when we did that, um, that was on the ballot in November of 2018, voters again responded overwhelmingly um, because I think voters agree that um, no one who works full-time, no one who works hard should live in poverty should have to face those choices of putting food on the table or, or paying the heat or paying the light bill. Um, and so voters responded overwhelmingly. This got um, nearly 1.5 million votes. It passed in I believe 84 Missouri counties. Um, and the, the candidate who got the most votes in 2018 was, was then candidate, now Senator Josh Hawley. Um, and he got, a quarter of a million votes less than Proposition B did. So this was not only very popular, um, this is popular in rural communities, this is popular in urban communities, this is popular with Democrats, this is popular with Republicans. Um, it, is, it is the right thing to do. Um, and Missouri voters did it. Now, um, of course, since then, um, business groups and their allies in the legislature continue to attack um, the minimum wage. And in this case, not just the minimum wage, but also the voters who passed it. Um, each of the last two years, we have battled and been able to defeat bills that um, would seek to repeal the minimum wage. Let, in the last two years, there were actually perhaps of interest to this group, two specific bills that sought exemptions um, for religiously affiliated schools um, that they believed specifically um, that the government should not regulate um, schools that have a religious affiliation. Um, we found that partially ironic um, because many of the strongest voices in support for raising the minimum wage come from um, faith traditions, um, not, not just Catholic, but you know, is Islamic and Jewish and, and other um, you know, Christian traditions um, that, that I don't actually know of a faith tradition that does not speak about the dignity of work and workers. Um, yet there, there continue to be bills, and I'll speak to this at the end actually on Tuesday, um, there is a bill to once again overturn what the voters have passed and the, the law as it currently exists in Missouri. So there continues to be this back and forth um, over 
any way that we seek to raise the wage, um, you know, primarily business groups and their allies in the in in the legislature seek to overturn it. Um, but you know, as I have mentioned, we we have continued to hold those attacks at bay. Um, and today, the minimum wage is ten dollars and thirty cents an hour. Um, but there continues to be a movement um, led by workers. I think it is important to always think as to whose voice is being centered, whose leadership is being followed, um, that um, workers continue to push and advocate for what they need and what they deserve. Um, so I'm gonna to try to close as I did with, with FDR when he, he had a sort of moral case back in 1938. Um, this is a quote from the, the Reverend Dr. King, um, that there is nothing but a lack of social vision to prevent us from paying an adequate wage to every American, whether he or she is a hospital worker, a laundry worker, a maid, or a day laborer. Um, I continue to think that this is true, um, that there have been and always will be people who will claim that raising the wage and dignity for workers will cause um, economic collapse or destruction. The reality is in 1968, when the minimum wage had the highest value that we had, the US economy was growing at rates that we haven't frankly seen since then. And so we should continue to have the courage of our convictions to fight for this. Um, and then I will always um, come back to the motto of the state of Missouri, um, something that I always like to keep in mind, that is the welfare of the people shall be the supreme law of this state. And if we are not centering the lives and the welfare of people, of workers, in our advocacy and what we do, um, then I obviously think we are we are doing it wrong. Um, so I will perhaps pause if this is okay, um, Sister Bass. And, and it looks like there are a couple questions that um, that have come in and. Uh, and we can hopefully go into to breakout rooms. Yes, yeah, there's a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, thank you for this enlightening historical look at our uh, Missouri's history with the minimum wage, well, our nation in Missouri's history. And um, let's see. Diana asks, can you clarify differences between living wage and minimum wage? Yeah, I mean, the, the living wage is a, is a term that often gets used. Um, it, is, um, it is something that is generally um, tied to looking at um, costs of rent, um, costs of transportation, costs of food, um, cost of childcare that, um, that exist in a, in a community. Um, as FDR began in 1938, I think he wanted um, min the minimum wage to mean a living wage. Um, but the fact that the two terms have diverged in meeting, um, you know, probably tells us how far we have come from, from that original purpose. Um, that now there is an argument um, that the minimum wage is not meant to be a wage that you can sustain yourself on. This is an argument that is made by business groups often um, that um, a minimum wage is not something that is meant to provide enough subsistence to, to survive on. Um, now, I will point out that um, 
a lot of the workers who provide min- who work in minimum wage or lower wage jobs are in fact some of the very workers that have been deemed essential um, in the, the, the recent pandemic. I am talking about childcare providers. I'm talking about nursing home workers. I'm talking about retail workers, grocery clerks who stock the shelves. I'm talking about food preparation and service workers who, prepa- who are preparing meals, um, preparing meals for us. Those very workers that have been um, deemed essential in one way are also told that your job is not meant to provide you a wage that you are meant to live on. Right, right. And as you're saying all this, um, I would like to remind everybody our first Catholic social teaching document, Rerum Navarum, is all about dignity for workers. And um, so if you want to go back and look at that. <laughs> um, so the next Christine and um, Cheryl kind of hit on the same thing. What is the path in Missouri to get to fifteen dollars uh, an hour for workers? Yeah, so so Missouri is frankly part of the nationwide movement. There are over thirty states now that have raised the minimum wage above the federal level, um, and that is in part because. In June of 2019, um, this country actually passed, I think, a grim milestone of the longest period since 1938 in which the federal government has not raised the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Missouri, um, you know, has has joined many other states that have sought to um, take matters into our own hands. And, um, and increase the wage, but that is certainly part of a movement across, um, across, uh, you know, across many states in support of this higher wage at the, at the federal level. I can speak to this sort of a little bit at, at the end, but there's currently um, an effort to, inqui- to uh, increase the minimum wage, to phase in an increase of the minimum wage, to $15 an hour as part of the COVID relief package um, that is moving through Congress that should be voted on um, in the House of Representatives next week. Um, And Missouri has in many ways been a key linchpin to that federal fight because part of what Missouri has shown is that this does not need to be a politicized issue Um, In the very year in which a conservative um, was the candidate who won the most votes, um, uh, uh, 250,000 more people voted to increase the minimum wage than than that person. The minimum wage has unfortunately gotten politicized in a way, but I don't think that is how most voters view it. And I'm I'm hopeful Mm -hmm. that we can get back to centering the dignity of work and workers and not which political party benefits from, from an increase or not. Right. Right. And then that speaking of the federal government, um, the next questions are, are around what, how does that play? Missouri is higher. Our state is currently higher than the federal government minimum wage, but if the federal government passes this, can you explain how that will work? Sure. So Missouri currently has a phased in, we are currently phasing in increases of, of the minimum wage. We are at 1030 right now. We will go up 85 cents next January 1st to 1115. And then an additional 85 cents the following January to $12. That's what Proposition B did. Um, if the federal um, if a federal bill is passed to increase it, well, if, if the federal bill um, moves at a faster rate than what Missouri v- voters did, then we will be at the federal rate. Um, if it moves slower, then we will continue to be, you know, we'll continue to be ahead of the federal rate until the federal rate passes us passes us by. The current proposal on the federal rate, I believe, is to 
phase in to $15 by 2024. So it would be a, a longer out period. So we would probably still increase it at our rates and then um, continue on with the federal government rate as that goes on. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Uh, now, uh, Sister Pat has Murphy brought up the idea of this. If the this limit, living wage determination versus the minimum wage, um, what about different cost of living in different areas? So she's bringing in that cost of living aspect. Um, should should we all have the same minimum wage or living wage? Because obviously it's more expensive to live in California than Missouri. Correct. Um, and this is a uh, this is a sort of irony that I see sometimes in the business argument against the minimum wage, because when a local community, the city of St. Louis, it is more expensive to live in St. Louis than it is in other parts of the state. And so when St. Louis sought to raise the minimum wage, the business interests said, no, you must have uniformity. Otherwise it gets confusing for businesses. It's not fair. You, know, you need to have a uniform thing across the board. So now when there's a federal government push to increase the minimum wage, and this gets to the articles that I think were linked, um, you see people saying, no, you need to consider local conditions um, as to what is, the, uh, what is the appropriate minimum wage um, in, in different areas. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, the, the last the last time I was I was looking it up, I don't think there is a community in Missouri when you think about a living wage. Um, if you are a single parent, where the living wage is less than fifteen dollars an hour, um, you know, and so um, the argument that that fifteen is too high, or you should consider local considerations. Um, I will admit, I'm sometimes, you know, I, I understand the argument about you should consider local considerations. It is certainly more expensive to live in New York City or Los Angeles than it is here. But what I find is that the people that often make that argument use the argument whenever it suits them. Um, when a local group moves to raise the minimum wage, then, then they seek to cut it. Uh, um, and then when the federal government seeks to raise the minimum wage, they, they scream for local control or local considerations. Um, when the, the bill was passed to nullify St. Louis City's ordinance, um, not a single representative from the city of St. Louis voted for that bill, not a single one. And so that was an effort in which um, legislators from actually the sponsor of that of that bill um, is from rural northwestern Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, he makes a point that he does not live in St. Louis. He does not travel to St. Louis, um, but he felt it was appropriate for him to lead a push and pass a bill um, to to do that. So. Um, you know, I think in the answer to the question is yes, local considerations are important. They, they should be considered, but um, sometimes the minimum wage is, is frankly a blunt, art, is, is a blunt tool um, meant to combat people that are disingenuous about how they use that argument. Yeah, yeah. Um... Barbara has asked, because we, we do uh, responsible shareholders, and um, Sister Barbara has asked about a script, Express Scripts. Um, yes, I know, sis, I know Sister Barbara's leadership yeah. um, in that campaign, and that was, um, that was critically important. This is actually a campaign where, where faith leaders, um, yourself, I believe um, some leaders in the Lutheran Church, um, were very effective. I, I, I haven't heard about this for, for maybe a, a year or 18 months, but the last I had heard is that 
Express Scripts agreed to hire responsible contractors, um, and um, which was, you know, included um, companies that were unionized, where workers had a voice and were paid a higher wage um, than the state minimum wage. I'm not sure if it was fifteen dollars or not, um, but I know that uh, with a lot of your leadership, um, that that was a successful campaign to have that company um, to have that company do the right thing. And there have continued to be other companies across the state, corporations where they have responded to the movement of workers demanding digni dignity. Um, and as the, the wonderful uh, opening, opening prayer, um, you know, sought the courageous rise of workers. Um, I think it is always important to remember though that any company that we see that is paying $12 or $15 now, they did not make that decision in absence of the, ri the courageous rise of workers. Um, I sometimes see people heap praise on corporate executives for raising the minimum wage. And while I would say certainly uh, that is the right decision for a corporation to make, it is the moral decision for a corporation to make, it is the courageous rise of the workers that made those decisions happen. Yes, yes. And then I guess for the last question right now, um, is $15 still a realistic living and minimum wage? Well, I mean, that is that is the sort of long struggle about the minimum wage. And as you looked at that chart at the beginning is it has these sort of peaks and valleys. Um, no, I mean, $15 was the demand many years ago. Uh, um, and where that has been met in places like Los Angeles and New York, in New York, workers are going to continue to demand more um, and and do that. In other places, we're still fighting to get there. Um, I think from from the perspective of Jobs with Justice, we will always continue to listen to the workers, listen to the leaders, um, and and hear what they say they need, and in, in order to have a dignified life and living. And um, the, uh, after we have our discussions, we'll have more in the chat. We can put more in the chat box. We would like to share. Um, thank you for answering all of our questions first. <laughs> we will share more about how people can individually connect with Missouri Jobs at Justice and Richard. And we will also share how communally we can take actions moving forward. So that is upcoming. So, right, but for right now, yeah. it's time for this breakout session and discussion around all of this. So, um, Richard is going Let to. Me, yeah, I, I can screen share again. And um, Richard um, is going to share the breakout, the questions for the breakout session. There's three. And Jenny is also going to place them in the chat box for whenever you get to your breakout session, you will have them there in your chat room so that you don't forget what they are. Oh, Richard, do you want to read those? Would so you these are a, a little nuanced from, from the email, but um, I didn't include the links to the articles that were in the email, but um, you know, the, the three questions that uh, I always think are interesting around this are um, one, this first question about um, whether a business that depends on an existence for paying less than a living wage has any right to continue in this country. Um, you know, I think this is a fundamental question at the debate of the minimum wage is should the government be able to tell a business owner um, what, what to do? Um, I think second is the, the recent bills in the Missouri legislature have sought a uh, exemption to the minimum wage um, for this group, you know, specific on the notion that government should not be able to regulate religious institutions. Um, you know, do you agree with this? Uh, why or, or why not? 
um, and what should be the role of religious institutions in, in, in setting this. Um, and then the third question is, uh, obviously my presentation lists out a long history and debate with who should be able to set the minimum wage and whose voice should really be prioritized in the debate, um, who should get to decide what, um, what a minimum wage or what a living wage is. And there were two articles um, linked to that um, in the original email that, that went out, if you had a chance to read those. Thank you for these. And especially number two, we have a lot of teachers and principals on, former teachers and principals on the call. So should be a good discussion. And so Jenny has put the questions in the chat box. And now you will, whenever Sarah initiates the breakout rooms, please click join and you will have around 20 minutes to share. And when we come back, also remember to unmute yourself. I'm sorry about that. When you get into the breakout room, you will have to unmute yourself. Uh, Sarah will now place us into chat rooms and have a good discussion. And when we get back, please be ready to share. So we'll start. Um, Christine Holiday, would you like to share? Sure. So, I mean, I think our group had some, some very spirited conversation about the role of government and the balance of government and whether government is a, a force for good or not. But I think our question uh, to Richard is we sort of were wrapping up, we really focused in on the, the conversation around the parochial school system. And so just what what, if any, have been the conversations that the Archdiocese has had with Missouri Jobs with Justice? Uh, what, we just would like more information about sort of where that dialogue is. Um, so historically, a, a person who has been a strong ally on the minimum wage um, from the St. Louis Archdiocese that we have worked with is Marie Kenyon in the Peace and Justice Commission. Um, and, you know, she has just been been very passionate and and strong on this. Um, I think the uh, that has been the not knowing all of the hierarchy or or different things like that has sort of been the limit of the archdiocese involvement has been through the peace and justice um, commission and and Marie's leadership. Um, Historically, there had been some involvement from the Missouri Catholic Conference on the issue of the minimum wage, but um, they have they have not been involved, and we have asked um, on the efforts to uh, prevent any repeal of the minimum wage, whether on the parochial school issue or 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 more generally, um, the. Uh, in the campaign in 2018, the uh, archbishops of, of the different regions had a joint letter that was in support of raising the minimum wage, although not specifically on Proposition B. It was sort of a recognition that uh, the Catholic tradition stands against poverty and for dignity of workers but avoided any specific prescription of, uh, of action to take. So um, that, that has been that. Um, I will also say on the other hand, the, the, the Catholic conference and, and the Catholic church has not been involved in supporting um, exemptions for parochial schools either. Um, so they've just, they've been um, other than Marie and the Peace and Justice Commission. I'm not aware of their involvement. Yeah, and I'll take a moment to say the Catholic Conference is the four bishops um, in the state of Missouri, and they put out a they put out letters every once in a while about policies and laws happening in Missouri. Um, Kay Komodos has their group has questions. <laughs> Okay, you're unmute, on. Kay, unmute. Got it. Sorry. Sorry about that. 
Um, we had some great conversations. Um, one thing we talked about was the uh, difference between bigger companies compared to your smaller company and the number of employees they hire in that uh, are smart, smaller companies is a harder thing for them. You know, but uh, one uh, person asked, um, she would like to know, you know, if there's a way we know, can find out which companies, which of these small companies are paying their employees a fair living rate wage because she would like to know, is there a place you can find that out? I don't know. And um, if so, you know, be more supportive of those kinds of companies. Um, the second question uh, that was brought up is that it uh, was known that um, at one point writing a letter spoke, you know, volumes. It, it represented like 50 people almost. It was speaking for the like 50 people. And is that still the case? And if so, who should we write to? Okay. Those are great questions. Um, so first on the, on the business question, um, so on Proposition B in Missouri in 2018, there were over 500 businesses that came out in support of that. Um, those were overwhelmingly small businesses because oftentimes small businesses have both more intimate relationships with their employees um, and they recognize the tremendous cost in turnover and retraining and low morale. Um, and so small businesses are actually who typically lead the charge on, on, um, on raising wages. Small businesses also know that higher wages mean more purchasing power um, in consumers and specifically in lower wage consumers. If, a, if someone who makes $10 million gets an extra million dollars, um, they don't typically spend that immediately in the economy. But if a lower wage worker who is making decisions between essentials gets a raise, they often put all of that money right back into the economy generating um, generating more economic activity and success for businesses. So what we've traditionally seen is that small businesses are key allies. Um, in fact, in 2017, anyone in St. Louis might remember, um, you might have seen signs that started popping up that said, we pay the fair wage, um, that sort of had the St. Louis flag on them. That was actually in in response, those were businesses that agreed to pay the higher wage as prescribed by the St. Louis ordinance, even though the legislature had nullified that ordinance. And they, they were very critical partners in the, in the statewide effort. I can try to get a list of, of some of those businesses um, and send around, but they tend to be locally owned um, not corporate franchises. Um, corporate franchises tend to have uh, more prioritization of shareholders um, and stock dividends than, than local businesses who often focus on the team there that, that is at work with them. So um, Jobs with Justice this year when we had a, our end of the year holiday party included um, uh, discounts to some local restaurants that supported raising the minimum wage. And we had sort of worked with them. And so they provided discounts and we tried to drive them business to, to reinforce this, the, the message that we should uh, put our values with our feet and with our dollars. Um, the, uh, the other question was, um, sorry, remind yep. me. Um, the, our or I think you've answered both of hers. Yeah. Did, did he answer both, Kay? Also, if anybody from any other group would like to share, please type it in now while we. Okay, the question I had was regarding who do you write to? Who should you oh, write to? Is right. the writing a letter still really important? Right. Um, so 
Uh, I will get to this a little bit maybe in, in, in my closing as to where there are opportunities. I mean, because there is both federal legislation that addresses this in a positive way and um, negative legislation <laughs> um, that, that addresses this on the state level, um, you know, you can really, there, there are multiple targets. Um, so your, your US, US congressperson and US senators on the federal piece and letting them know that you support the increase in the minimum wage and COVID relief. Um, and on the state level, um, writing to right now your state representative um, in opposition to House Bill 726. And I can send this as, as notes afterwards, um, which is a repeal of the minimum wage. It would actually take our minimum wage from the current level of 1030 to 650. Um, so it would be an almost 40% cut in the minimum wage. Um, and that bill is being heard on Tuesday afternoon at 4.30. Um, if the ranking Democrat on that committee is I believe in the, the zone of particularly the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet, uh, Representative Steve Butts, um, who I, I bet you all know, um, yes. is, the, is the ranking committee member um, from the Democrats on that. So him hearing from you, um, I, I, having talked with Steve about this issue, I'm confident of what his position is, but, but being reinforced in that position and encouraging him to fight strong would be important. Good to know. Yeah. And if anyone, you can go to the Missouri legislature website to find out who your representatives are. Um, so it doesn't look like anyone else would like to share. So we can go ahead and, and um, wrap up our morning today. Thank you again. Claire, did you did? I think um, Barbara Jennings yeah. from Carondelet had something. Well, well, she was talking about Richard. Uh, Richard, she was talking about Catholic schools. Um, closing and everything. Well, as the population declines in Catholic schools, more Catholic schools are closing. Um, and then we have a fund here in the, at the, in the St. Louis Archdiocese called the Today and Tomorrow Fund. And they, it's a fund to allow more students to try and attend Catholic schools like scholarships, it grants scholarships to schools to for more students to attend Catholic schools. But in the midst of all this, um, you know, it's a, how do we um, balance? How do how do how can we um, be more active in promoting living wages within our Catholic schools and churches? Yeah, I mean, I I don't, um, you know, I I don't I. Th this is part of part of the debate, as I think it goes back to to FDR, you know, in the very beginning is, you know, should institutions rely, have, you know, should their economic model rely on employees living in poverty? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that is a fundamental moral question. Um, and I know lots of wonderful people who you know, have said to me, like, if I can't run a business, my brother is a, is an auto mechanic. Um, he's a small business. He's four employees. Um, and he has always said, if, if I can't make my business work in a way that it also, that it works for me and my employees, then I'm doing it wrong. It's not successful. Um, and, you know, I, I personally think that is true. And so while I know business owners and, and institutions have many things to balance. Um, it is always easy to think cutting labor costs is a way that I can find a little bit more money here or doing something there. But I think it, it betrays something deeper um, if that is your solution to doing that. So I, I don't, you know, I, I don't to pretend to people have to make the decisions that they think are right and business owners have 
many things that they need to weigh, but I think the living conditions of your employees should be a high consideration and not something that's yes. easily ignored or discarded. Yes, yes. So regarding all of this, we need to um, talk to our bishop and people who run the uh, archdiocese more, the superintendents and everything, to make sure that we um, have our concerns voiced. Um, so would you like to give some closing remarks on how we can be more connected? Sure. Um, let me, sorry, let me try to do, did I lose my ability to screen share? Oh no, here we are. Um, so, is, you know, a, a couple ways to act. Um, and a lot of these things are sort of moving constantly and often changing. So I would encourage, you know, and, and I, I see people in there who are familiar names to me, um, you know, Sister Jennings, Diana Les Aleskovich, others, um, you know, and and I appreciate your, your leadership and cooperation and, and collaboration over the many years. Um, I would encourage people to visit the Jobs with Justice website. It is um, just mojwj.org. Um, you can sign up there to become a, a, a member of Jobs with Justice. Um, you can, you know, which helps make sure that you will get emails and things from us on, on issues that are moving and, and opportunities to act. Um, you know, I always encourage a plug. You, you can um, make financial contributions in support of, of our work, um, whatever you, you feel best and, and called to. Um, for any of you that are on social media, that is another way that we try to keep in touch with people. Um, as this legislation comes up and, and moves fairly quickly. Um, so we are both on, on Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram. Um, and then finally, there are really the two ways to act right now. Um, as I mentioned, the phased in $15 minimum wage is part of the latest COVID relief proposal, calling your congressperson or senator to weigh in um, in support of that. Um, that should be voted on in the U.S. House of Representatives this week, um, and it will then move to the Senate. Um, and as I mentioned, in the Missouri legislature, a bill to cut the minimum wage to $6.50 an hour will be heard on Tuesday afternoon. It is House Bill 726. Please call your state representative to offer your feedback on, on that proposal. And um, I will be in touch with you. We are um, considering having a, a sort of virtual press conference um, or something on that uh, earlier on the do on the day on Tuesday, and so um, and we might be re inviting Representative Butts to that. But if uh, if any of you would like to be a part of that or or speak on that, um, we could potentially provide a role for that um, and do that. But you know, otherwise, I mean, we really appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. Um, I appreciate all of the historic work that you all have done and, and fighting for justice for working families in Missouri. And we hope we can continue to collaborate and partner with one another um, in the future. Yes, thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us, Richard, and informing us of all that we can do to help and join you in working to raise the minimum wage. And so as a, so I'll be on the lookout for, we're gonna share how you can sign up to be on Missouri Jobs with Justice email and follow them on social media. And um, as you, as a community committed to anti-racism, we would, we would like you to, we would like to make you aware of an upcoming opportunity. Today, we learn more about external efforts to fight racism, but on April 5th, we will begin a transformational journey together, personal journey, as we go through the program Becoming Human. Be sure to register for that when possible. That's 
um, racial, our racial and cultural justice committee is also um, inviting us to do becoming human as a committee to do a pers some personal work on anti-racism. Um, thank you again. Thank you all of us for, to all of you for joining us on this Saturday morning. And um, that wraps up our event today. <laughs>